Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. Coming up, Spider Co. Reveal number eight. Nothing new, but in new materials. The Empress Tomahawk from Wingard Wearables. And we take a look at some of the Tanto folders, actually all of the Tanto folders in my collection. It's a shockingly low number. I thought it would be more. But first, it's always my first opportunity to show off a knife. Uh, we're going to do a pocket check. And I, I want you to do this along with me and just kind of talk at your screen. Or you could call the listener line, 724-466-4487, or leave a comment in the comment section. Let me know what you're carrying today. It's always interesting to me. and. Uh, even if it's a one word or two word comment, like Benchmade Griptilian, we'll say. All right, anyway, coming up, my pocket check. And now is the time. Today I'm carrying a classic. This is almost 20 years old. Yes, that's right. Maybe even older than some of the listeners out there, but probably not. Uh, this is the Microtech LCC. LCC stands for Lightfoot Combat Compact. Uh, yes, Combat Compact. And uh, it is a really beautiful knife. This one indeed uh, is es especially beautiful because it's in this brown linen micarta. <clears throat> and it's got titanium bolsters. And uh, if you slowly roll open the blade, you'll see this uh, very nice clip point there, kind of a very aggressive clip point that puts the point down the center line of the entire knife, kind of in line with the pivot. And it is, uh, it's a gorgeous knife as you can see, but it's also a, a unique knife. This is a double action. So I'm just going to gently put it back in like you normally would, flick it back out with my thumb like you normally would. But you can also slide the bolster for that automatic action. And, uh, well, it's kind of a parlor trick in this case because you can open it up in two different ways. But uh, oftentimes you'll see this sort of slide bolster release or um, scale release is the only way to deploy the knife. And then you'll have people trying to open it and they can't and they can unless they know how um, the knife won't open. We're going to see a little bit later on in Life Knife News. Uh, Knife Life News, Chuck Gadritis has something uh, very similar coming out, um, and uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But so this this uh, double action LCC is a is a prized knife. Uh, I have not had this for twenty years, but when I was going through a Microtech stage and and uh, after the first time I interviewed Greg Lightfoot. I sought this one out because I remember it being a bit of a grail for a lot of people way back when, uh, before people were calling them grails, and sought it out. I love the blade shape. I found one, and uh, lucky to have it. It's not an easy knife to find, uh, as they, ha they haven't made them in years and years, and uh, people aren't so ready to give them up. You can also find them in carbon fiber, which was very unusual 20 years ago uh, to find carbon fiber on knives, so that was kind of a a high tech thing there. Uh, okay, so next uh, in my pocket today, I have the Tangram Santa Fe. Tangram, where have you gone, Tangram? Uh, so they are a uh, budget line of uh, Kaiser that came out. They were kind of the first budget line of these Chinese uh, makers to come out. Now we have CJRB to Artisan, we have Civivi to We, uh, but Tangram was sort of the first, and it was Kaiser's version, and they just sort of disappeared. And I'm wondering if that's because Kaiser has their premium lines, and then they have their uh, Vanguard line. Vanguard line is uh, designs that they make uh, frequently that they make in the um, <laughs> in the uh, uh, premium line, except in sort of lower grade materials. And Tangram was like their third bottom of the barrel tier, but really they they produced some really great knives in that period of time. This, this was one of them. As a matter of fact, this is the only Tangram I ended up keeping. I had a couple others and they were all great, but I ended up selling them to get other knives. But this, I just won't part with. I really love this knife. It's super, super smooth on bronze washers. And as you can see, it's got that really nice Warncliffe blade. Warncliffe with a bit of a belly, so I'm not sure what you're gonna call that. Maybe that's a clip point, maybe that's a 
a sax or a drop point, who knows? I, I think you can call any knife a modified drop point and you're safe. So uh, maybe that's what I'll call this. Uh, one thing about this is the super smooth action. And then this steel on this knife, um, where is it? Right there, JPN, here, let me hold this up. Hold this up to the camera, JPN Acuto or Acuto. This is sort of a Japanese version of 440C. Uh, it's a great steel. This is a thin blade stock and a very slicey, slicey blade. And uh, the 440 Akuto, at least for the tasks I've used this for, which probably is mostly like crafts with my daughters. And this is a great paper cutting knife on a mat just like this. Um, that steel works just fine. It strops up really quickly and uh, yeah, it keeps a pretty good edge. So have this in the pocket today. I haven't carried that in a while, uh, but I was kind of going through my case this morning and it jumped out at me. And I'm one of those people who believe your first instinct is your best instinct. Uh, even though that instinct has not served me well uh, all the time, but today I chose that and I, I'm not going to go wrong with that. It's not too important a choice. So we'll just roll with that. Thirdly, I have an interesting knife that maybe someone can help me identify. This is a little custom knife I bought at a flea market on 6th Avenue in New York City uh, 15 years ago or something like that when I was buying all the swords that you see on the wall behind me, the uh, Filipino sword, uh, World War II bringbacks. So this is a little neck knife and that's the maker's mark. It looks like MWH or, or MMHW. And I just don't know who made this, but it's a great little thick slab of a knife. And uh, it's a three finger knife with a uh, handle that's contoured as if it's a full grip, but it it works perfectly as a, as a three finger knife. And I used to have a little fob on it, took that off. Uh, it came with a pretty, pretty horrible uh, Kydex sheath. I made another horrible Kydex sheath, except this one is a little more form fitting. The problem with this is I just can't pull it out. So <laughs> it's a problem. So I, I think I'm going to uh, cut off a big majority of this top part. I think it's just locking in place because there's a, a big detent there for the for that finger twill. But if anyone knows what this MMHW Maker's Mark stands for, I'd love to know. I would love to know where this knife came from. Uh, I guess technically this was my very first custom knife because you can tell it's a, uh, you know, handmade and, and a, um, you know, a small batch handmade custom knife from 15 years ago. So if anyone knows, please let me know. I'm dying to know what that is. I said no a couple times in that, but uh, that's because I want the knowledge. Let me know. All right. Well, uh, coming up this week, tomorrow night's Thursday Night Knives, uh, is the Gentleman Junkie Giveaway. And this week we have, this month we have something extra special cool. Um, this is one that I got with the intention of giving away, but for a moment, or maybe two or three moments, I thought about keeping it myself because it's so up my alley. This here is the Kershaw Strata XL. It's a um, modern interpretation of the classic Spanish Navaja folding knife. It's got the stylings of, got sort of Art Deco stylings here with these, with this copper pivot cover and this really interesting horn-shaped handle. You know, this horn-shaped handle is very traditional, but as you can see from the milling and the design, it's an untraditional take on that. Uh, it is a thin steel frame lock and it is pocketed out. If you look inside there, you can see they've, for weight relief, they've uh, carved out some pockets in that steel. And this thing is extremely light and very thin. It's less, I think it's, uh, it's uh, 0.45 inches thick. So it's a little thinner than your usual knife uh, in width or yeah, in thickness in the pocket, let's just say. I can never get that straight, the thickness and the width. But uh, it rides, I carried it once. Uh, didn't cut anything with it. So don't worry if you're a gentleman junkie and you're looking forward to getting this. I have not cut anything. It is still a virgin blade, but I did carry it in a, in a pair of jeans one day and it carries like it's a thin, light, small knife. There it was barely noticeable in the pocket. Uh, part Thanks in part to this awesome fold over clip. And you can see they made the 
G10 side just a little bit longer to accommodate this loop over so that they're uh, parallel to one another, which I think is a really cool detail. And you can see those standoffs are also copper. And the blade is very thin and very, very, I would imagine, slicey. But like I said, I didn't cut anything with it. But, you know, I have a few teeth left in my head and a few friends in town. And I can tell that this thing uh, will slice incredibly. If anyone knows what movie that line was from, let me know. Maybe there's something in it for you. But you can't look it up. If you look it up, I'm going to know. Uh, so <laughs> this is the one it's on KVT bearings. It is a uh, very light, very pocketable five and a half inch bladed, uh, Navaja. It is the Kershaw Strata XL. And, uh, this is what you get. If you, uh, win that wheel of destiny spin for the gentleman junkie giveaway that <clears throat> this month, excuse me. And that is the month of May, the glorious month of May. It's beautiful out right now, and uh, I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, next, we're going to do Life Knife News. Knife Life News, I do that every single time. And then after that, of course, the state of, co of the collection. Uh, but first, I want to ask for you to help us in the show. Please help support the show on Patreon. You get knife stickers, a mention on the podcast, early access to the Sunday interview and the midweek supplemental shows like this one. You get a monthly knife spinning wheel giveaway and uh, we're cooking up a couple of new exciting opportunities and some new exclusive content uh, your support really helps keep this show going and we appreciate it so check us out on patreon and see what helping us can get you go to the knife junkie.com slash patreon that's the knife junkie.com slash patreon got a question or comment call the knife junkies listener line at 724-466-4487 so, Knife Life News. There, I said it correctly this time. <clears throat> we have a couple of interesting stories. <clears throat> Excuse me. A couple of interesting stories this week. Uh, one of which, the first one, is pretty apropos to an interview I just did that will be up uh, in the next couple of weeks with Chuck Gadritis, who is uh, a custom knife maker who's making incredible um, well, he's been making incredible knives for a long time, but I've only keyed into him somewhat recently. And he's specializing in automatic knives and folders in these really, really intricate builds. He's, he's a bit of a sculptor. He's a 100% automatic knife maker. He makes other kinds of knives also, but he's very influenced by the New England school of custom knives, um, like uh, Bill, Bill McHenry and, and other folks like that. And actually in the interview, we go into what that style uh, entails, what, what the New England style of folding knife entails. And it's very interesting. And to me, it reminds me of that seafaring Northern sort of Moby Dick thing. Um, maybe that's just uh, due to some of the designs he's been coming up with recently, like his Marlin shaped swordfish uh shaped automatic that is just so crazy impressive do check him out on instagram it is an amazing follow and he's a great guy uh, but he's got a very interesting uh, new sort of um, palatable across all tastes in the knife world knife that he's been making and it's called the it's kind of a swiss army knife style uh automatic and uh, he's calling them the switch army knives Get it? Switch army knives. And uh, as you can see, they look, they have the same sort of uh, overall profile and shape that the uh, Swiss army knife has. A uh, number of people had been asking him, can you make something a little more traditional in shape uh, for the automatic knives you're making? You know, you're making these incredible sculptural art knives, but do you have anything also that's a little bit more commonplace? if you would. And so he came up with this and it really, there are these uh, knives that look just like Swiss army knives in profile. And uh, of course there are different materials and such, but they are like the LCC I was showing you before. They are slide scale automatics. <clears throat> so you just slide the top scale uh, over. And you know, if, if, if you can imagine taking the scale and squeezing it between your fingers and letting letting them slip, uh, that is what makes the, the blade deploy. Uh, similar to the LCC here, when I move the bolster over to the side this way, 
you see how that uh, that action makes the blade pop out. Well, that's what's happening here with his switch army knives. Now he's not uh, taking any orders for these. He's just creating them and putting them up on Instagram gram, and people who are interested uh, can try and get one. Uh, his his work is much, much coveted, and this is a really unique uh, sort of knife. So good luck getting one. But if you want to get one, if you want the opportunity to get one, you have to follow him on Instagram and follow him pretty closely. And when he releases one, when he makes one and puts it up, you know, you better be quick with those thumbs uh, and, and try and get on this. But uh, something I really like about these designs are that they feature the uh, the traditional toothpick and tweezers, which are two of the most uh, useful tools, in my opinion, on the Swiss Army knives. And uh, so he he features those, you know, creates little pockets uh, and puts those in there. Most of them are single bladed, and he's got four different blade styles, a clip point, a, um, a sort of uh, Barlow style drop point, a regular drop point or a spear point, and then he also has one variant called the Magic Knife variant that has the uh, traditional bottle opener slash screwdriver slash pry bar. And that is not automatic. That is on a liner lock. But sitting right next to it is an automatically firing clip point blade with that, with that slide release. That's not the right term, but the... Um, scale release where you slide the scales and it pops out. So a very, very interesting thing, um, you know, kind of even difficult to describe. So go over to Knife News and check it out. They have, a, uh, they have an article about it this week, or even better, check out the uh, upcoming Knife Junkie podcast interview with Chuck Gadridis, uh, episode 218. That'll be up on Sunday, May 23rd, 2021. Also give Chuck uh, a follow on Instagram. It is um, enlightening you get to see a lot of his projects as they are in the works. I always like that when Instagram uh, pages feature that, when knife makers feature their knives as they're being made. That's always very interesting to me. So do check that out. So uh, you know that Spyderco last year in the year 2020 started this uh, reveal way of releasing their knives. Instead of uh, in excuse me, sorry about that, dropping knives over here. Instead of coming out in January with their full catalog and letting you know what they're going to be making over the course of the entire year and building up anticipation, which would fizzle out as people became frustrated that the knives that they really wanted weren't being released yet, Spyderco decided to release all their new models in reveals, that is uh, drip releasing them throughout the year. And uh, so that that way, you're not building up anticipation that that isn't being met uh, immediately. So this uh, this past month, they just came out with their reveal number eight, and uh, I'm calling it nothing new, but in new materials. And that's kind of a, a standard tactic of Spyderco. Uh, maybe tactic isn't the right word, strategy. They, they release uh, oftentimes, uh, during the year, they'll release new models that are collaborations with designers or in, new in-house models. But they also will come out with some of their most popular models in different iterations. And one thing they've been doing over the past few years are these lightweight models of their classic um, and very popular models. And uh, so they'll they'll give them the FRN handles and uh, just give them new treatment, new steels. And so that's what they're doing this time. And that's the entirety of the release uh, of this reveal. They are featuring, let's see, on the Endura, the Andela, and the Delica, something new that they're doing is full flat ground blades with serrations. Usually their serrated blades or half serrated blades have been, uh, for that series, the Andela, the, the Endura, and the Delica have been on saber ground blades. So you're getting a much uh, much more oblique angle behind the edge with those serrations. But now they're doing the serrations on a fully flat ground. So presumably those serrations will be even more razor sharp because they're gonna be on stock that's much thinner at the edge. Uh, but the one that I'm most excited about is the resilience. That's the big, uh, big bladed, uh, we just had it up on screen, blue handled knife. Now it's coming out in the, in the lightweight blue handle. Um, that's sort of, uh, 
translucent handle you see on the Manix Lightweight. Same thing. They've got the bi-directional texturing. And, um, but we know this knife as the largest of that budget line that, that features the, um, the persistence and the, this is the resilience and the, uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You know the thing. Come on, man. You know the thing. Uh, so instead of the full steel liners with G10, uh, which weighs a bit because this has a, the resilience has a four and a quarter inch blade. One of the reasons why I really like this knife. They're coming out with this lightweight version and fully serrated, which also is very appealing to me. So I think uh, for 70 bucks, that's a pretty good deal uh, for a four and a half inch bladed knife. Now you can, uh, the lightweight version is going to come out in 8CR13 MOV with the black lightweight bi-directional FRN handle. And then it will be out with an upgraded steel S35VN with that blue handle. So that's the one I'm more interested in. And actually, I'm not sure what the price of that one is. I'm pretty sure the 8CR13 is the one that's coming out for 70 bucks. So nothing new, but in new materials from Spyderco in their reveal number eight. And uh, for Spyderco fans, this is a great way to do it because some people just get uh, ravenous. That's not the right word. Some people get very, uh, um, well, I'm going to use it, ravenous about collecting uh, single models and they will get it in every iteration they can and spider code just kind of just keeps churning out um, new versions of tried and true designs like the paramilitary too you can find that in so many different configurations especially when you take in consideration sprint runs and exclusives from different retailers so it's an exciting thing for people who are uh, hot and heavy on a certain model and that's what they're giving you during this reveal, reveal number eight. Lastly, CJRB. I was mentioning before Tangram uh, Knives is the budget line or was the budget line of Kaiser. Well, CJRB is the budget line for Artisan Cutlery, another high-end Japanese, or, I'm sorry, high-end Chinese manufacturer. They have just announced a super slicer called the Scoria which to me is a very good looking knife that they're going to be releasing at, at Blade Show this year. That's uh, in less than a month now uh, down in Atlanta. And this is, they're sort of considering this the, the spiritual cousin of the recent and very popular um, knife that they came out with, the Feldspar, uh, which just kind of went gangbusters. That was a Mallory design. And uh, this one is an in-house design um, really with the aim of making something very thin and very slicey. It's got a 3.4 inch blade on um, bearings, of course. This one is both flipper and thumb stud, and they are using their um, um, proprietary steel that they're using on their more budget line knives, the ARM steel. What is it? ARM9. And uh, we've gotten good feedback from that steel from people like Mike Emler. Um, who designed the sea snake for them and they put it in that steel. And he is a steel aficionado being a, uh, a professional sharpener as well as knife maker and knife designer. And uh, he's been very, very happy with that steel. Uh, AR RPM nine is what they're calling it. AR dash RPM nine rolls right off the tongue. Um, but uh, very, very good news about that steel. And I like the look of this uh, Scoria. I think it's a nice looking knife, especially with that swedge running along the top. And of course, what is that? That is a drop point. You can't go wrong with drop point, can you? You know, even, even you take a look at your average reverse tanto, a term that makes me bristle. That too, I believe you could call a modified drop point. Scoria coming out with a black blade or a regular uh, um, satin blade. And I, it, this is going to be in their budget line. Obviously, it's a CJRB, so it should be around... 50 bucks or so. Looking forward to that knife. I have not gotten the Feldspar, but the different uh, versions they've come out with featuring micarta handles and, and such have been, have been tempting. It just hasn't come my way yet. And sometimes if it's not something that I'm really excited about, I have to just kind of be given an opportunity, you know, just to get one for free or for, <laughs> or for, uh, you know, a good price or whatever, maybe in a trade. And uh, that's how I've gotten some some 
great knives in my collection that I wasn't necessarily looking forward to. This one I am looking forward to. Okay, well, still to come, uh, the state of the collection, I'm gonna show you a, a really unique tomahawk I just got. And we're also gonna take a look at my Tanto folders. Uh, I was kind of looking through my collection this week, uh, looking for Tantos, and I was a little bit surprised at uh, how few I have. And maybe that sounds, uh, I, I shouldn't put it that way. But I, I kind of thought I had more. Let me just put it that way. But before we dig into that, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and uh, click on the notification bell. Click on the notification bell and click like. This is a demand I'm making. So you know each time the videos are uploaded and uh, well, and so that you let me know that you like what you're listening to or watching. And join us tomorrow night for Thursday Night Knives, our weekly live stream, where you have the opportunity to join in uh, just by going to the knifejunkie.com slash join. Boom. Just set, put some light on your face and set up your camera or your uh, your phone and join and talk to me. And let's uh, let's talk knives together. We've had some pretty lively conversations uh, with people from ranging from over in Ireland to people down in Mexico, our, our good friends of the show. And uh, it's a really, really good time. Of course, tomorrow night on Thursday Night Knives, we will be uh, giving this sucker away. So you don't want to miss that. But first, you'd have to go to Patreon to become eligible for that. Anyway, that's Thursday Night Knives right here, 10 p.m. Eastern, every Thursday night, streaming live. Again, that's Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern, right here. Today's podcast is brought to you in part by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. Okay, so I'm always talking about Instagram. It is a great way to find new makers and to keep up with old makers and just to really get your fill of knife content. And someone I discovered recently, I didn't discover them actually. It was some, one of our viewers slash listeners sent me an email saying, have you heard of Wingard wearables? I was like, no, I have not. And uh, they sent me a link. I started looking at their work and on their Instagram page, and I became fascinated. Wingard Wearables out of Pennsylvania. Uh, Zach Wingard is their proprietor, and and I think he's the he's the guy coming up with all the ideas. And they are interesting, cool ideas. And I really began to find myself going back to one model that they make over and over and over in terms of, hmm, maybe I should get that. Maybe that should be a part of my panoply. Just just so that, uh, you know, I have a fully rounded out set of dot, 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 tomahawks. They make a couple of really cool tomahawks and some other really interesting implements. But this is the Empress tomahawk. And I'm going to leave, I left it with the Kydex sheathing on it just to show you how unique this system is first. So as you can see, it's got two sides, a main blade and a hooking blade. And it's on this really cool I mean, it is protected by this really cool Kydex system here. This is a flexible cord here. You just pull it there, pull it there, and it reveals this amazing blade. This is um, uh, not forged. It is, um, um, oh God, sorry, people, having, having a, a, a senior moment here. It's cast. That's the word I was looking for. It's cast from high strength silicon bronze and then hand sharpened and patinaed and fixed to this American hickory haft here. Uh, and the whole thing is based on the megalodon. We all know what the me megalodon is. That's the ancient version of the great white shark, the ancient and giant version of the great white shark. And if you look at the main blade on the Empress Tomahawk here, you'll see that this emulates the shape of the Megalodon tooth. It is uh, somewhat flat on this side and rounded on the front side and very sharp down here and then uh, a broad shape up here. This is 
definitely a self-defense tomahawk. This is not something that you're taking to the campsite to split wood. This is something that you are perhaps keeping on your person or keeping on the bedside stand or keeping in the car or whatever it is uh, for a for a tense situation. Um, or in my case, you're collecting it because it's just such a cool thing. And actually, it looks like it would fit very well with the uh, Filipino swords on the wall behind me. Incidentally, uh, from, from the videos Zach has put up on this and his other uh, weapons that he makes, I think he's done Filipino martial arts, it seems. In any case, you have on the front, you have the Megalodon tooth, which uh, extracts very easily from whatever it's being um, thrust into. For instance, if you look at this, this is the Hogue Tomahawk designed by Alan Alishowitz, another favorite of mine. Uh, if this were to go into a medium, you would have these two hooks or beards to overcome in, in pulling it out. Uh, this tooth shape just goes in and out. It's uh, sort of based on that, uh, uh, on the tooth concept. You know, you don't want it's, to, it's not getting hung up on material. Uh, and in the back here, you see this hook. Now, this is where you can really see what the wearable thing is all about. Wingard wearables. If you look at this, the head is curved. You see that? The head is curved. So you've got this front blade and then this back hook curves around so that it contours to your body. You can wear this on your waist. Uh, you can even slip it in your belt if you have these uh, front and the back covered up. You can slip it in the belt and it conforms to, to your waist and uh, you can wear it around pretty easily. Um, so this hook here is sharpened on the bottom, and again, it's uh, it's broad on the top, and it's really meant for hooking and pulling and uh, ripping um, material. And uh, it is attached to this hickory handle, which also uh, looks a bit like a shark. You've got these grooves here for grip, but also kind of looks like gills. You have this shark-shaped, shark head-shaped pommel here that you could use for uh, control and, and sort of puño strikes and that kind of thing. And, uh, I guess overall this Empress Tomahawk really captured my imagination. It's very unusual. Um, at 13 inches, it's about the same size as, as this, uh, Hogue Tomahawk, but it's just something very different, something I've never seen before. And, uh, I like its, its inspiration the Megalodon shark. Uh, to me, it's, uh, it's a new take on, on an old tool, and I applaud Zach and his uh, innovation. He has a couple of other things. He's got another tomahawk that he produces, uh, which also looks interesting, a little bit bigger than this, um, and heavier. I say heavier. This is only nine ounces, nine ounces with the sheath, so eight ounces without the sheath. It is super light. I mean, I have a I have some uh, folding knives that are heavier than this um, than this tomahawk. Very interesting. Check out Wingard wearables. They also have something called the quill, and uh, I'll I'll just let you look that up and find find that. It is a very interesting piece of metal that you can do a lot of interesting things with. Um, so check check them out. Wingard wearables. Very excited to have this tomahawk. It looks good on me, doesn't it? I think so too. All right, next. I have a knife on loan that I don't want to return. I know I say this every time I, I have a, a loaner knife. This is something that Dave from This Old Sword Blade Reviews on YouTube and on Instagram loaned me. It's called the Wee Blacau. And as you can see, it is just fantastically beautiful. This is designed by Miguel Barbudo, a Spanish knife designer and maker. And you can really see the Spanish influence. You can see the, uh, the, yeah, the Spanish influence in that clip point blade and in the overall shape of this gorgeous knife. Uh, it's made by Wii, so I'll get that out of the way. You know it's, it's a fantastic build being made by Wii. You can see it's got the, the Wii clip with a little bit of jimping here. But besides this very unique looking clip point blade, that is screamingly sharp, screaming sharp, at, uh, with a flat, with a, a saber grind and a relatively thick stock. I'm not sure how they do this, but it is one of the sharpest knives 
I've uh, held in quite some time. And I'm not sure if Dave did any uh, work on that edge. Somehow, I think this is still the factory edge. Um, so very, very sharp. But check out this unique thing. It's a back lock, as you can see. But it's done differently than your usual back lock. As you can see, when you when you push the, push the uh, spring down, it's got a little strap here on the back that locks into a notch. And it's right up there on the top of the blade. It gives it a different sort of action. You can definitely flick it open with just your thumb. But if you slow roll it, or, or I'm sorry, when you bring it back in, it has a stop point right there. So it doesn't stop, it doesn't drop shut. You have to click it back in. You can slow roll it out. As a matter of fact, Dave wrote a note saying this, uh, you wanna open the box and opened it up. There was a note saying this, deploys a little bit differently than you might expect. So slow roll it the first time just to get an idea. And there's definitely uh, a, an, overcome, an overcoming spot. I mean, it's on bearings, it's super smooth, right? But here when it's almost closed, there's a stop. And when it's almost open, there's a stop. And you have to overcome those either with just pressure with your thumb or just by giving it a little extra juice when you when you open it when you flick it but it flicks open easily with those bearings it, it works up enough momentum that by the time the blade gets to that uh, last little stopping point it just clicks and locks open you know i'm not a huge fan of carbon fiber but this this marbled carbon fiber is really really beautiful feels great in the hand the ergonomics of this are incredible and I cannot find it anywhere. <laughs> I've looked all over. It's sold out everywhere. I'm not sure if they're going to do another run of these. I really hope they do. It's also a 4.2 inch blade, so it's a little bit larger than than your average knife and you know, I love that aspect of it. It's just a winner. I I love it. I have a couple of we made knives from uh other designers that have used them as OEMs. But right now in my collection, I don't have any just straight Wii knives. And uh, boy, this would this would really, really fit the bill. Really fit the bill, Dave. I really like this knife, Dave. So let me know if you're going to sell it. I want the right of first refusal on this. As you can see, it's got that uh, beautiful titanium bolster. And it reminds me of, uh, of two other knives. And I'm just going to show them real quickly. Of course, it reminds me of the Espada by Cold Steel, which is a based on the Spanish Navaja. And, uh, you know, you can see the, the slanted bolster and the clip point blade, everything about it. I mean, it's, it's reminiscent. It's in the same ballpark. But another knife that it reminds me of a lot, and it's uh, a, quite a bit different, is the Boker Squail by Charles Marlowe. Yeah, I know it's a different blade shape and everything, but something about it, I feel like they're spiritual cousins here. Um, as soon as I pulled the Blackout out of the package and uh, and took a look at it, I went right over to my cabinet and got the Boker Squail out to take a look. And they just, something about them, they, they would go nicely together. Um, and they do, if you just look at them here. <laughs> Great knives. Uh, thank you, Dave. I really appreciate the Blackow um, for the loaner. I sent him my big Drago tack by Bastinelli Knives. He seemed to like that. Uh, I'm not suggesting a trade, but uh, you know, we we sent each other knives. They they were ships in the night, and uh, at some point soon, I'm going to have to send this thing back. But I've really grown close to it in the short period of time. I also like that bird's beak on the pommel. By the way, it makes for a great. Uh, great thumb rest and just a very secure grip. And uh, I have about medium sized hands and I see, you see with those two, um, those two choils there, you might think that you're being kind of forced into a position, but there's plenty of room there. I feel like someone with big, big uh, meaty mitts could grip onto this without any, any problem. I really hope they come out with another uh, batch of these because like I said, I really couldn't find them anywhere. And I went to, uh, even went to eBay and couldn't find one there. So I think the people who have the Blackow really love it and they're not letting go of it. <sighs> Woe is me. I know, first world problems. But uh, 
hopefully at some point soon, they'll come out with that and I will have my very own. Or hopefully Dave is sick of his and will sell it to me and, uh, and then I'll have one. Okay, let's, uh, let's do a quick little journey into my knife collection. I wanna talk about Tanto blades, uh, folders in particular because um, I think it's an underrated blade shape. I feel like some people think the Tanto was a phase or a, a trend, uh, but that Americanized Tanto with the faceted tip is an incredibly useful knife. And uh, it's not just good for, you know, people talk about its penetration uh, capabilities, which of course leads to, well, what are you penetrating? Well, it makes a great tactical knife. And that is for sure but it also makes a really, really good utility knife. And some people even think a great outdoors knife. Um, not being much of an outdoorsman at this stage in my life, I can't really judge on that. Uh, I can't see why it would be bad, but uh, I think it would be an excellent outdoors shape just because you have a couple of different edges to work with. I'm gonna start with my oldest folding Tanto. I got this in 1997. Uh, in the winter of 97, when I was working on a film in New York City, and I decided I'm working on a new project, I should get a new knife. And uh, this is the old Cold Steel Voyager in the uh, in the old FRN handle, Grivery handle, with the integral clip here. You can see that clip is just one part of the handle. And uh, I don't even know what steel they were using, but it was made in Japan, so maybe it's an AUS steel like they've been using in the past. Uh, it's been sharpened a million times, as you can see from this, from all the scratches on here. Hollow ground blade, very sharp when I got it, continued to be very sharp until I wore it out, and then put this current edge on it when I got my KME sharpener, which I have uh, I have reservations about. Not the KME itself, but, but my use of it. Uh, I sort of put it down for a while, but it does put, it did put a screaming edge on this, uh, on this cold steel Voyager. And though this was pre triad lock, it really had a very, very strong back lock. I mean, their back locks were always very strong, even before they went to the, uh, indomitable triad lock. Uh, one thing about this knife that I did was put some skateboard tape on the spine so that I could get a little bit of grip in there. And as you can see, there's no real guard here, uh, stopping your fingers or your hands from sliding up on the blade if you were to, to push with it. So I put this little lanyard here just, just to uh, keep it in the hand when I'm using it. And I, well, I haven't really used it much in a long time, but uh, for a while it was my EDC. And by while, I mean a couple of years and uh, it was supplanted later by a couple of other cold steel folders. But this was a revelation to me because before I got this, I only knew cold steel for their um, fixed blades. And at that point, it was the Tanto, the Magnum Tanto, and the Trailmaster, and maybe a couple of others. But when I saw them come out with this, I thought, that's it. That's it, man. I got this at... Uh, um, Paragon Sports in New York City, the only place that they can still sell knives in New York City. Um, and I think it's because they sell custom knives and they somehow that that slips in a loophole because they're custom. So uh, at the time they were selling Cold Steels and, and other uh, popular brands. So very cool knife. Next is an unusual Tanto. This is designed and made by Emerson Knives. And this is the CQC 15. This was a gift to me uh, from our a good friend of the show, and Bill S. And uh, well, I just uh, well, I love it. I used to have a 15, and I sold it, and I regretted it. And then, lo and behold, Bill S. just sent this to me. It was his daily carry for a while. He had removed the clip and actually lost the clip, so I put an old one that I had lying around on there gives it sort of a seasoned look, don't you think? But this is uh, the super model. So that means the blade is a full four inches and the broadness of it, it's very broad, but it's still the same blade stock as their smaller blades. And so you know what that means. That means that it is sharper because the blade is broader with the same thinness 
So at the edge, it's very thin behind this chisel edge. And if you look at the chisel edge itself, you'll see it's a pretty broad edge. It's, uh, you know, the cutting edge itself is pretty broad. So all of that adds up to an incredibly thin and slicey, sharp blade. What's unique about this, and I have a few others in this um, lineup that are recurved tantos, but this one is recurved with a belly. Uh, frequently, you'll see a recurved tanto that's a, a kind of a hook here because it's a, a recurve, a curve going inward, and then it terminates with that straight. But this one, like the commander, has a recurve, a belly, and then the faceted tanto tip. This was actually a design uh, that Ernest Emerson made thinking of the Commander and the CQC7 put together, and you can really see that uh, in this blade shape. This incidentally has a silver uh, aftermarket thumb button that I just love, a little touch of class, and it has great action. This is one of the single detents. Uh, that big giant blade just flips right out. CQC 15. I'm so happy uh, that I have this back in my in my collection. I have a bit of a a rule now with Emerson's, and that is that um, no matter what else I sell off in my collection, I just love Emerson knives so much, and I like Ernest Emerson so much uh, that I'm just not going to get rid of any Emersons. I think I'm just going to keep them all from here on out, and and sort of regret the fact that I've gotten rid of two CQC sevens, an eight, and some others uh, in the past. Uh, 15. So I'm, I'm from here on out, they stay. Next is one of those recurved tantos that I was just talking about that doesn't have a belly. Uh, this is the Jared Von Otterloo designed Greg Lightfoot made beauty. This is the element. Some people might call this a clip point. I call this a tanto because of this secondary point right here. So you have the recurve, a, a very sharp, short little recurve, and then this long, broad front section. Here's, by comparison, you can see how long and broad that front section is. That terminates up at a very thick tip. So the tip, if you look at it in cross section, you'll see that the tip of this blade gets very wide for thrusting and, you know, for, um, you know, say you need to jam this into a 55 gallon oil drum, you're not going to worry about that tip breaking. Uh, incidentally, though, it gets it starts very sharp at this secondary point. And as you get to the tip, it's still sharp, but not in that same sort of slicey, keen fashion. I think it's a beautiful design. I featured it recently on, on an Instagram post that got a lot of um, attention. People liked it just because the shape of it is so, so unusual and so beautiful. And people are used to seeing Lightfoot knives, Greg Lightfoot made knives that are very ornate with bolsters of, you know, Timascus with all sorts of crazy handle materials and different patterns and such. And uh, I asked for a quote unquote tactical version of this knife, uh, meaning I just wanted some, I wanted it to be usable, carryable, um, and uh, some, you know, in my favorite materials, I love micarta. Now, the funny thing is, is I still don't use it and carry it because, first of all, it's as thick as the day is long. And uh, also, it's kind of something I just don't want to jack up. So I'm not really carrying it around much. Every once in a while, I'll pull it out. Um, and you got to wear jeans if you want to carry this because it's just so thick and and heavy. But what a beautiful, beautiful piece. I mean, look at this. It's about three quarters of an inch thick. <laughs> and uh, it's got this great uh, um, uh, Damascus, uh, what's his name? Chad Nichols Damascus clip. So he threw that in as a little tip of the hat to his more ornate style. Greg Lightfoot uh, is a really interesting dude living up there in Canada, living a rugged life and uh, making these incredible knives. So. Very happy about that one. So along the same line, but very much uh, a production knife and very much smaller is the SOG Kiku XR. This is another recurve Tanto. Uh, I'm very fond of this knife. Probably my favorite SOG um, 
right in front of the uh, seal XR, the SOG seal pup XR. Wait, what is it? The SOG, yeah, the seal XR, the big clip point. To me though, this is more carryable and it's just a little bit cooler. You've got this incredible um, sort of harpooned recurve tanto shaped blade and it's really sharp. It's hollow ground on this main cutting surface and then it's flat ground here for strength. And then you have this swedge. Do you, would you consider this a harpoon? I, I, th I think I'm going to consider this a harpoon. Uh, that swedge makes it strong at the tip, yet it gives it that diamond cross section, which makes it like a dagger on the thrust. So uh, just a great knife, really nice micarta here that we don't see often on SOGs and uh, or SOG or studies and observations group, whatever you wanna call them. I call them SOG, and great ergonomics. This is only a three inch blade, right? Three, yeah. This is only like just a hair over three inches, but it feels like a bigger, more capable blade than, than three inches. It's very sharp. It feels great in the hand. The ergonomics are fantastic. And uh, the only place you see their name is on the blade and then a bit you know, embossed on the handle, but it's not overt. You know they've had uh, they've had a lot of issues in the in the in the recent years with just over billboarding on some sort of cheesy designs, but they've had this this uh, sort of rebranding in the past couple of years, um, and the result of that is some classy looking knives. I think that their XR lock, which is a ambidextrous bar lock similar to the Axis, is hit or miss. I've had a few. Uh, handled a few that are great. This is one of them. I mean, this one is just perfect, perfectly dialed in. You just, if you, if you release the lock, the blade just falls and it's perfect. I have uh, a Terminus XR where it's just not as tight. And, and if you're putting more pressure on the thumb side than the finger side, it'll jam up. It's, it gets crooked and, and weird, but this Kiku XR is Really, you can tell they put a lot of energy into this knife. And it should, they should, because uh, it is a costly knife. But I'm very happy about that one. Next is the ZT, a classic. This is an Emerson design, the ZT0620. Uh, this one in LMAX. Yeah, LMAX steel, one of my few LMAX bladed knives left in my collection. You know, ZT had a troubled past with LMAX. I think they had worked it out by the time they got to these Emerson collaborations. This was the very first Emerson collaboration of three, the 620, the 630, and the 640. And uh, I have put my car to handles on all three of those because the 620 and the 630 just had these uh, very, l mm, I don't wanna say lame, but very plain G10 handles, black G10 and I just had to get my card up, so I got my card up. This, I love the sort of blend of the clip point and the tanto. I love that downward shape here uh, on this tanto blade. This emulates the ETAC, which is a, a Emerson design, uh, not one of the more common Emerson designs, but that that ETAC tanto, and. Incidentally, it's kind of hard to see the grinds on this because of the black, the diamond-like coating on this. But if you look at the S35VN version of this knife that they came out with, it had um, carbon fiber handles. It was sort of their upscaled version of it. You can see the grinds and you can see that swedge. There's a beautiful swedge there and, uh, and that tanto tip. This is probably, uh, probably my favorite of, of all the knives I'm going to be showing. I love this knife and it's so stout and sturdy. A lot of people like Emerson's best when they're made by ZT. I am not one of those people, but I, I see what they mean because this, this titanium frame lock with the ZT build is just, man, it's amazing. It's an amazing uh, ode to Emerson's designs. You got that giant hook, that giant wave there that that uh, really deploys the, the knife great. Uh, it came with a Emerson style slash Benchmade style clip that said ZT on it. I removed that and put one of the, the standard Emerson clips on there just so it's a little more low profile. 
That is the 620. The next one you might say is not a Tanto at all. I say you're wrong. Uh, it is the Cold Steel Immortal. Yes, I know. It's it's uh, fashioned after the Roman Gladius, the 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 emblematic sword of the Roman legions, uh, with that triangular tip. But if you look at this knife, it is a Tanto. If you just remove, hear me. If you just stop looking at the top part for a second, and you look at this straight hollow ground section and this faceted tip, this thing is a Tanto. It's just a much broader Tanto with a with a very large swedge. Am I right? I mean, I think I know I'm right, but let me know what you think about this. Does this count? Am I am I cheating? Am I just sneaking this one in? Uh, to me, this is a Tanto, and with that dagger-like cross section at the front, a really, really effective Tanto, because we're talking about, uh, one of the things we talk about when we talk about Tantos is the penetration, as I mentioned earlier. Well, with this swedge setup, it's going to penetrate much, much more easily. Uh, don't forget that I sort of blunted the tip a little bit, as I am one to do here. So this is the Immortal. To me, this is, uh, I, I consider this a Tanto. It's kind of on the Tanto shelf in my collection, and uh, I'm going to stick by that. This is discontinued, unfortunately. And this one is in CTS XHP. They came out with the S35 versions for a couple of years uh, when they made that switch from XHP to S35. I'm glad to have gotten the XHP. I just like that steel a lot. Immortal. It is a Tanto. Next, probably my second favorite in terms of uh, design. This is the K2 by Riot. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous blade. Look at that. It's an upswept Tanto with a long swedge on top, but like long swedges that I like the best, it terminates right near the thumb, so you still have full thickness on the back of the blade for your thumb. I do not like it when you have to rest your thumb on a swedge like that. So uh, they did that perfectly there. They did everything on this knife perfectly. The handle to blade ratio is ideal. It almost looks one to one. The hollow ground portion of this blade is very thin. It gets very, very thin. And then this forward portion, the forward sort of upswept chisel portion is flat ground and very stout. The action on this is typical Riot awesome, but I've heard from some real Riot collectors that this uh, stands above even most Riots in terms of how smooth and amazing it is. This is one that I've sort of, in a glancing way, considered selling because I figure I could get some decent scratch for it in, in my pursuit of other knives, but I just can't let this one go. This is, uh, I have two Riots. This is the only branded Riot. Uh, the other is... Uh, the arch uh, is the um, is is an arcane design, and I just don't want to get rid of that one because I love that one too. But uh, this is my only branded Riot, and I'm going to keep it because it is just amazing. In the hand, in reverse grip, you've got this incredible run of jimping up here, raised up above, proud jimping, if you will. And uh, everything about this knife is appealing to me, but especially that incredibly ground Tanto blade. These are hand ground, and what a fantastic job they do with these. I love seeing the grind lines, by the way. I'm a big, uh, <laughs> whoops, I'm a big sucker for their, um, for their hand ground satin blades, so. Okay, the next one is a teeny tiny one. This is the Concept Pelican. Concept is uh, a, couple of guys left Kaiser and created Concept, and they brought the building prowess with them. This is a great knife designed by K. Maxram, a French knife designer, and uh, just a beautiful Tanto. You've got that long front portion, but there is no, um, there's no separation between the grinds there, between the flat and the front chisel. Very ergonomic. You've got a, a swale to put your thumb and uh, I just, I love this little sucker. Great little knife. This is S35VN and titanium, you know, as usual. Two more. Let me just show these real quick. Look at this. The absolutely ridiculous but incredibly compelling Medford Praetorian, um, which 
is a slab of steel. Look at that thick slab of steel on these thick, actually relatively thin, I should say, handle slabs. But the cool thing about this knife is that despite its giganticness and despite its super thick blade stock, it gets really, really thin and slicey with that hollow ground, um, hollow ground uh, straight portion there. Yep, this is D2 steel, which some people would balk at for the cost of this knife. Um, I might be one of those people, but you know, in reality, does it make a difference? Not really, because I'm not using it in such a way that I need some other steel over than D2. Great knife to Spidey flick using that fuller. All right, and so no folding knife Tanto collection would be complete without, yes, the Recon 1 XL. Tanto. Love this thing. And uh, it is a much coveted, one of the most coveted knives in my collection. These, these XL Recon 1s in XHP steel. I guess they did not make them for very long. I didn't have uh, much trouble getting mine when I, when I was seeking it, but uh, it seems like right after I got this, I was starting to get offers from people. You know, are you looking to sell that or the Bowie version of it? Uh, of course, my answer was no, but um, love this shape. Cold Steel really popularized, if not created, this uh, Americanized Tanto shape with the hollow ground straight, very, very thin behind the edge, hollow ground straight, and then the quite robust uh, chisel tip there. Such a great knife. You get a point there and a point there for flicking and other kinds of uh, tactical techniques, knife fighting techniques that Lynn Thompson, uh, you know, uh, championed and uh, that tanto shape is just made for that so there it is that's my lineup of folding tantos uh, i'm sticking with it i don't think i'm going to sell any of these uh, but i'm also not on a rampage to get more right now so um, if i see something out there that really captures my imagination so vivi came out with a new uh, budget tanto recently uh, i can't remember what it was called but uh, that actually uh raised my interest a bit. Maybe I will continue. But for now, this is what's going to do me uh, in my collection of Tantos. All right, people, thank you so much for listening uh, and watching this uh, parade of of my knife collection. If if anything, these kind of episodes act as a um, an archive for future for future me to see what I had at uh, this time of my life in terms of my knife collection in specific categories and uh, had to had to give a little tip of the hat to the Tanto. Join us tomorrow night for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern, our live stream, and uh, check out who wins the Kershaw Strata XL. Uh, hopefully, maybe it's you. Uh, it can only be you if you become a patron at the gentleman junkie level. So uh, if this interests you, please do so. If you have any interest in supporting the show, you can do it at three different levels and any level is greatly appreciated. If you don't feel like supporting us in a monetary fashion, like, comment, subscribe, like, hit the like, just like it. And uh, it, it really takes two seconds. You're like, but Bob, I don't like it. But I'm saying you do because you've you've waited this long. You've watched this long. So do that. Also comment and share the video. Send it in the link to someone that might like it. All right. Also check us out on Sunday for a great interview show. And, uh, you know, keep your eye out for more review videos. They are coming your way. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying thanks for watching. And don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast